Hi, this is Paul. I spent yesterday working on a big video. What is a Christian? I haven't recorded anything yet. I was just working on the PowerPoint. It's a big, big project. I love to see if it ever bears fruit. But it very much flows out of the little off-the-cuff video I did, Who's a Better Christian, Jordan Peterson or John Verveke, and some of the uh, off-the-cuff comments that came at. You know, there's, there's sort of a YouTube as Twitter with when you entitle something. Um, i got to check the sound levels. Okay, sound levels seem okay. So the conversation that Nick and John Verveke had for the Q&A last Friday was absolutely tremendous. I was so gratified by that. And we've got some other guests coming up at Bridges of Meaning for some of these. I've got some vacation coming. And so I won't be around, and so we've got some other pinch hitters coming up, and hopefully they'll they'll hit better than I do. And uh, so looking forward to some of those. I was so so happy with um, with the conversation with John and Nick. Just just did an unbelievable job. One of, one of the things that so my conversations with John have been prompting me is to think about this word theism, and I don't remember if it was Nate or someone else recently in a conversation basically said, well, you know, that word theism isn't really very old, and I thought, there's all these things out there that you just live in this world with this word theism, and you don't think anything of the word or how it's used, and theism sort of just becomes, you know, a Christian word, or if you're a Christian, you're a theist, et cetera, et cetera. And it got me thinking, well, what, 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 what about that word? And so then you just throw it into Google and uh, origin, theism, Greek, theos, yeah, God, I know that one, Englishism. That's where the word comes from? Slate 17th century. Ooh, that's really suspicious. Then cruise over to the Wikipedia page, which was decent. Uh, the term theism derives from the Greek theos, or theoi, meaning God or gods. The term theism was first used by Ralph Cudworth. And I thought, I've never heard of this guy. See, I'm not a philosopher. My background in philosophy is not that good. Ralph Cudworth, 1617 to 1680, this is 1688. Now that's a real those are that's a really suspicious time period. That's basically a hundred years after the Protestant Reformation. Um, now we're getting into the 17th century, and a lot of things get really interesting and sort of wonky in the 17th century, including Calvinism to a degree. And so what's going on philosophically? What's going on under the surface at that point? In Cudworth's definition, there were strictly, um, they, they are strictly and properly called theists who affirm that a perfectly conscious understanding being, a being, a mind, and this gets into this conversation that, you know, where Verveke comes up and says, um, is God a being? And this gets into my conversation with Brett Sockold. God is not inside the system. And this gets into the question of sacraments, because, of course, Sockold was writing, um, was writing transubstantiation. This gets into... All of these philosophical assumptions, and not just as philosophical assumptions, they're these picture-thinking assumptions about the world, and then these language systems that somehow intersect with these, these pictures in our mind, and this gets into the cognitive science and the exaptation and all of the ways that, and you think about C.S. Lewis writing in his book Miracles about what he thinks London is. And so, well, that just sort of drove me in further because I'm a digger. So that, of course, sent me to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. English philosopher Ralph Cudworth, 1618 to 1688, defies classical classification within customary categories of the history of philosophy. Well, that's interesting. At the time when mainstream philosophers announced their modernity by breaking with the past, Cudworth is a figure of continuity steeped in ancient philosophy, yet abreast in contemporary philosophy and science. He shared his anti-scholastic agenda with self-styled modernizers like Bacon, Hobbes, and Descartes, with whose philosophy he engaged, but framed his most original ideas by recourse to antiquity. Cudworth is usually regarded as a Cambridge Platonist, though he himself would not have recognized the label. Although he is normally classified as, as a rationalist, 
it has become increasingly apparent that this designation is based on too limited a view of his philosophical writings. And it sounds like basically his philosophical writings are, um, he's, you know, I, I felt that I, when I read this, I felt a degree of camaraderie with the dude as someone who puts out way too many videos for any reasonably important person to watch. I, I do not mean to, um, I do not mean to insult my audience, mind you, um, because my videos are things you listen to as you go to bed or you wash the dishes or you, I mean, this is, my videos are not the subject of academic inquiry. And I am totally good with that. In fact, I'm happy about that because my videos are me talking to you about things I'm thinking about you about and, and you enjoying it and you know, I get calls from people sometimes who watch, you know, 20 or 30 percent of my videos. And, and that's totally cool because who could watch them all? And as some of you have. And again, I, I applaud you for that. And I celebrate you. And um, I, you know, I, you know, there are other voluminous video makers like, you know, friends of mine like Burn and like Karen. And I don't watch all their videos, even even Peugeot. I miss bunches of Peugeot's videos and Peterson. So. Anyway, it sounds like this dude was basically doing this to his audience with his works, which he never finished. It's all they're all written posthumously and hardly anybody's ever read them. And I went to Amazon. You can find hard copies of them for, you know, 30, 40 bucks a thing. But I thought I'm not going to buy it because I'm not going to read them. You find I have to find them on the Internet somewhere. But here's a Here's, you know, OK, Stanford. Um, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy should at least give me a place to start anyway. Cudworth's written output was substantial, but much of it was never published, and his philosophical system is incomplete. <laughs> Man after my own heart. Broadly, his philosophy combines Platonist ethics and metaphysics with an atomist natural philosophy. Well, that's interesting. He is chiefly remembered for his epi epistemological nativism and his ethical idealism. Distinctive elements of his philosophy include um, his theory of consciousness and unconsciousness, his conception of free will as a power of self-determination, and his causal hypothesis of what he calls the plastic power of nature. The immense humanist learning which fills his published writings has tended to obscure his achievements as a philosopher in post-humanist times. That's Renaissance humanist or early modern, let's say. But it did not prevent him from having a considerable legacy in 18th and 19th century philosophy. And you scroll down. And, and you begin to realize that part of what this guy did was basically take a lot of this stuff and put English words on it. Hence, something like theism. You take the Greek word and you put the English ism on and here we have this term and it's a being and so suddenly triggers God number one, God number two, meta divine realm, all of these things that I tend to think about. Cudworth's legacy of bulky and incomplete writings testifies to his comprehensive knowledge of both ancient and contemporary philosophy. He subscribed to the Renaissance view of philosophy as philosophia perennis, perennial philosophy, which presupposes a single timeless core of philosophical truth, which is the shared goal of both ancient and modern philosophical inquiry, heir to the Renaissance humanist recovery of almost the entire corpus of ancient philosophy known today, his recourse to, an, to antique learning, especially to the philosophy of Plato and Plotinus, another known suspect in our little corner of the universe, but also Stoicism. In many ways, a typical humanist um, move to um, in, is in many ways a typically humanist move to ground authority in the tried and tested philosophy of ancient philosophers, Aspelin and Sellers, another known suspect. However, he turned to ancient philosophy, especially Greek philosophy, as a fund of pre-scholastic philosophical ideas and a source of a new conceptual vocabulary. Vocabulary is what we're looking at. As one of the first to write philosophy entirely in English, he coined many new terms, many of them ad um, adapted from Greek, like theism, even though that doesn't get a mention here. 
Some have not stood the test of time, while others, Cartesian, self-determinism, conscious consciousness. Why haven't we heard of this guy? Our common currency in English philosophy as um, to this today to to this today. At the same time, his philosophy was deeply influenced by contemporary philosophy, especially Cartesianism. He had high regard for Descartes as an acute philosopher, and his philosophy registers the impact of Descartes in multifarious ways. He admired Cartesian, Cartesianism as a system of philosophy contains physics with metaphysics, which posited both corporeal and incorporeal substance. There we get into our dual substances. Oh, lost my way here. Oh, there we are. He accepted clear and distinct perception as the criterion for epistemological certainty and their Cartesian account of sense perception. Sensation for Cudworth, as for Descartes, is a passion of the soul, at best a confused perception. He embraced both the idea of consciousness and the idea of God as a fully perfect, self-existent being, and adopted Descartes' conception of body as inert extension. However, he was highly critical of Descartes on many counts. He denied that mechanism rules, he denied that mechanical rules of impact were sufficient to explain natural causality and criticized Descartes' repudiation of final causes. He critiques Descartes' proof of the, exi of the, exi of the existence of God from his idea as circular, and his voluntarist conception of God as conducive to skepticism. He rejects Descartes' machine model of animals and denied that conscious cogn um, cognitation, cogitation exhausted the properties of immaterial substance. And then it goes on from there. And I thought, well, this is an interesting guy to figure out, and I started looking up theism and its origin because listening to John Verveke answer this question. So let's dive into the video. And it's not getting any sound. Okay, got it working again. Oh, from Richard, we have... Um... You briefly mentioned with uh, Jordan Peterson why you select the term non-theist and it having to do with dismantling assumptions baked into the theist-atheist dichotomy. As many have said, your most recent conversation with Rafe Kelly... Now, atheist... Yeah, uh, this is all tied together in this language. Kelly was a nice follow-up to Peterson, largely because you dive into those assumptions quite deeply. Can you succinct? Oh, I can't speak. Can you succinctly uh, lay out the frame that modernism and postmodernism is tap trapped into, and explain how that relates to atheism, theism, and non-theism? Um, and I actually have a, a slight follow-up question to this, which would be: um, How do you separate out non-theism from something like apophatic theology? Mm -hmm. So let's, I'll answer the first question first, although I want to indicate right from the beginning, I think the second question is deeply pertinent, and I think it is pretty much almost entailed by any answer I give to the first question. So thank you for uh, putting them together like that. That's helpful to me, because I, I, that way I can look forward. Um, so let's, the, what is shared about modernism and postmodernism is... Um, that's that's a hard topic, uh, but the shared presuppositions are largely those of modernity. I think it's correct and important to see postmodernism as a culminating critique of modernity. When I mean the the ideological worldview framework that was given to us in the Enlightenment in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, basically by the three R's, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution. Right? And so what modernity is, is an affirmation of both the necessity and sufficiency of a bunch of claims. Um, 
primarily, uh, these claims are claims of uh, this kind, uh, this kind of set of ideas. I'm trying to not, I'm trying to not use jargon as much as I possibly can. But one set of ideas is, is the idea of that truth is accessible by the application of a method, not through a rational method, not through the personal transformation of the knower. So the in, the knower, so if you compare now. now He offers a dichotomy. One might say, ask, are those the only two items on the menu? But he's offering this dichotomy, which is right. I'm not I'm not quibbling with what he's saying here, but wanted to put that in there. Personal transformation of the knower. So the, in, the knower, so if you compare, let's say, you know, uh, Augustine to... Descartes, and that's a fair comparison because they have they share a lot of similar arguments, as many people pointed out to Descartes. Uh, it'll go back to what he just said uh, there about the personal transformation of the knower, because that obviously is a is a, is a piece of what his conversation was with Peterson. But when we another one of the elements that we've been looking at quite often is sort of the view from the inside versus the view from the outside back to C.S. Lewis's uh, reflections from a tool shed, where when you're seeing through the light, it's one thing. When you're looking at the light from outside of it, it's another. And we've looked at this inside-outside perspective quite a bit lately. When you're in love, you have access to a certain kind of knowledge and knowing that you don't have access to when you're not in love. Um, you know, uh, love has its own reasons. We say things like that. Because there are, there's all these different ways of knowing. If you're inside of a family, you see things and you know things inside that family. And there's a certain kind of knowledge that you have. And these gets into his other three R's. Strawn is warning me about too tightly gripping these other three R's as opposed to the other. And I think John is right in that the three and the one are, in fact, it's not just one and three. They're, all four of them are tightly intertwined, and they're all working together in different ways. But, for example, being in love is a being in love is a flow state. And I remember, um, I can't speak for everyone, but I remember, you know, probably you know you have crushes and stuff when you have a kid. But the first time you fall in love. And it's reciprocated, and you you go into this thing that you've never done before. I mean, it it's a flow state. Um, it's it takes you over, and and there's a reason that ancients talked in taught you know described this as a very spiritual thing because the spirit Cupid comes up and possesses you, and you become a different person. This transformation. So again, John's talking about these these transformations. Now, obviously, the Enlightenment majors in. Okay, we're there's this this transcendent, this monarchical vision, this view from nowhere. We're going to take yourself out of this, and we're going to, as sort of a a therapist sitting with a um, let's say doing family therapy or something, and having an objective view of the marriage. What what is this objective view? Well, this is a view quite intentionally from outside. Compare like transformation of the knower, rational method, not through the personal transformation of the knower. So the in, the knower, so like if you compare, let's say, you know, uh, Augustine to Descartes, and that's a fair comparison because they have they share a lot of similar arguments. I'm going to have to look into that because I've never, I've never looked at those two. I don't know Descartes. Oh, gosh, the problem with this is I, I sit and I learn from these people. Because gosh, I don't know enough about Descartes. Gosh, I've never heard of this. This this Cudworth fella, you know, I don't have enough time to read all this stuff. I don't even have enough time to listen to all these videos. But here we are. As, as many people pointed out to Descartes in this time, so it's a fair comparison. But if you if you compare them, right, you see that Augustine is basically arguing individuals have to go through this fundamental transformation, and only after they do that will certain truths be disclosed to them. At least that's how I inter interpret Augustine. And and you know. 
So I'm a pastor, so I spend a lot more time reading the Bible than I do reading philosophy. And, you know, again, obviously Augustine is getting this from somewhere, like the Bible. Whereas Descartes says, no, no, you don't have to go through any transformation. All you need to do is use this method, and he's very, very confident in this method. This method will give you access to all truths, all the truths of the universe, all the truths of God, all the truths of humanity. Um, and it's a, very con it's a very powerful confidence. That confidence is born out of another presupposition, uh, assumption of postmodernism that becomes a presupposition in postmodernity, which is a, a, a deeply entrenched nominalism. And nominalism is the idea, I'm trying not to use too much, uh, I'm trying to, not to use... And again, you know, nominalism has been a baddie around, um, you know, guys like Rod Dreher and, you know, people who, you know, there's a lot of people who've been complaining about nominalism for a while now. Too much, sorry, but nominalism is the idea coming from Duns Scotus and Occam. I, I talk about this a bit in my series. And this is where Jonathan is more radical than people realize, Jonathan Pajot. Because nominalism claims basically there are no real patterns. Right? There are no real patterns. The, the, the patterns are only patterns in our mind. Our mind is what links things together and makes the patterns. All that's out there are raw, absurd individuals, absurd in the very technical sense of absurd. Like they have all, ultimately in themselves, they have no categorical meaning. In See, the beauty of interrupting is, you know, I, I shouldn't, you know, complain about Jordan Peterson interrupting John Verveke when I just do it again and again and again in my videos. But, it, you know, what, what occurs to me, and, and to, to what degree is this, is, is what he just laid out in terms of Descartes and nominalism, to, to what degree are these things indispensable to the totalizing of the scientific method that we have seen over the last, say, the culmination of modernity. There are no universals, all that kind of stuff. And see, once you think that, then you're put in this very weird position where all that the patterns are just in your mind, and then you just have to get them to rationally cohere with each other. The mind... Somehow the, the patterns are real in your mind, and the mind knows them directly, but there's no patterns in the world, and the mind doesn't know them. And so a, a, a powerful dualism opens up between the mind and the world, right. and you're going to get Descartes and Kant coming out of all of that. Right. Now what happens in, in the Enlightenment is the idea, ah, wait, and, and, and it's a really weird thing that comes through Galileo, because Galileo brings some Platonism in in a weird way to address the nominalism. Um, I think his instinct is right. I think ultimately Platonism is what you need to address nominalism. But what Galileo says is math is the language of the universe. So for everything else, we have nominalism, but math actually finds the real patterns. Right? And, and, and people have to appreciate that special privilege uh, because the people in the Enlightenment thought they had a response to, to nominalism, which was that math seemed to track the new emerging empirical science, experimental science, and the new the new astronomy. And so it was like, aha, but there is a language of the universe. That's what Galileo called it, and that's math. And that's why you've got the prioritization of math, and then everything tries to imitate math. So we get the idea of knowledge as a formal system, right, a formal logical mathematical system, so a purely structural, as the postmodernists will later say, because right, they also call themselves post-structuralists, this purely formal structure, and all we're going for is logical coherence. And then that brings the third thing, which is reason is nothing but logic. Reason is nothing but logic. Now, if you've listened to 50 hours of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, this all is fairly easy to follow, and this makes... I think awakening from the meaning crisis easier to follow too, because he nicely, succinctly kind of brings these things together. And if you've watched awakening from the meaning crisis, many of these pieces were in it. Okay, so all of those three actually fit together uh, very, very profoundly. If you think about it, now we're in just to track it. Now we're in like Kripke, uh, Hilbert. 
uh, the formalists yeah. Yeah. Uh, pre girdle basically. Yep, and also you can even see that in people like Levi Strauss in anthropology, where you have structuralism within anthropology, and you're trying to understand uh, culture as a purely formal system. Or what's going to be crucial for a lot of the postmodernists uh, is you have Saussure and linguistic who sees language as a purely formal system. That's why he constantly uses the analogy of chess to explain language, because chess is a prototypically uh, uh, formal system. What do I mean by a formal system? The chess pieces don't have any meaning in relation to the world. They only have a meaning that I assign to them within the game. And that's only a meaning of how, of how they function with respect to each other. It's a purely formal, purely self-contained, possessing no intrinsic meaning, and that I only give it as I play with it and manipulate it and use it. Now, the conversation that dropped yesterday was Peterson with Lawrence Krauss, and I'm looking forward to hearing that. I only began it because I don't have hours in a day just to do this thing. <laughs> but uh, the clip that showed up on Twitter was all about uh, a section where they get talking about meaning, so this is going to be interesting. And you see what a notion of language and culture and reason and knowledge you get from this. Right. Okay, so that's modernity, right? And, and, and there's more to it, but that though, and what postmodernism does is it basically comes um, and said, and, and, and basically it's bound to it because what it does is it critiques it. So let's start, let's start, let's go the other way. So is language a formal system? The deep answer is no. <laughs> the deep answer is no. This is why the problem of getting real meaning into AI, like this is the Chinese room problem and a whole bunch of other problems for those of you who know philosophy. The problem of getting meaning, not for us as we use it like a chess piece, the computer, but meaning that would be meaning for the computer even if all of us disappeared. Trying and, and that move right there is such an interesting one because and, and we're so adept, if we're watching ourselves make this move that he just made, imagine I'm the computer. That's an interesting move. Because we can do it. Or we think we can do it. And we all seem to have the same ideas as we do it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm tracking with him, I'm agreeing with him, I'm not critiquing him at all in there. But, but just that little move that we make, what a strange creature we are. Imagine I'm that computer, because what do I know as that computer? And we sort of know that because we, of course, are the maker of the computer. And when we do things with the computer, we're surprised what the computer doesn't know. Um, between the DR and Sacramento, I spent a little bit of time, needed a, needed a little job to make some money. And so I was helping out with a, um, with a place in Grand Rapids that they were trying to get all of their therapists to keep their notes on computer and that the organization at that point in the in the 90s was trying to scale up and get people on computer and I knew PCs and so I, I did a little did a little training work for them uh, I was because I could both speak computer and I could speak therapist and human and so I would try to get these therapists to learn how to use windows and word and and, you know, it was it was amazing, you know, get this document into the computer and they'd, you know, push pieces of paper onto, well, there's a hole, maybe I stick it in that hole and it's, no, it's not the way it's going to go. I, but again, you don't know what you know until you watch someone who doesn't know it. So we're, we're bizarre creatures. Trying to get that philosophy, the problem of getting meaning, not for us as we use it like a chess piece, the computer, but meaning that would be meaning for the computer even if all of us disappeared. And, and and when we're talking about meaning at that point, what, what, what kind of thing are we talking about? And and this is where, this is where so so Lawrence Krauss and that little tidbit from from Twitter, you know, basically says, no, we can engineer our own meaning. And it's like, I'm not sure that that's what meaning is. And and it's where Peterson sort of um, contests him on it because, you know, the whole business about well we're in some ways, as human beings, the, the big fight between, let's say, Christians, I'm going to use that word because I'm not going to use theists because 
that's not germane to it. I'm trying to use some relevance realization between a Christian narrative and and people who are skeptical about the Christian narrative, let's say, is a big part of this is that that Christians believe that immense amounts of our meaning derives from the ways that the actions in this one silo will impact actions in, let's say, the life to come. And and that seems analogous to us and the computer. The, the computer has no meaning. This language has no meaning inside itself because the computer, it, it seems to have meaning. We need to be able to cross into other worlds, as it were, or cross over boundaries and, and sort of begin to assimilate one world into the next. Trying to get that into has proved to be a tremendous problem. So I, I want to make it clear that this argument isn't just coming out of the postmodernists, but, but what they basically said is, right, so Derrida, his, his central note of, notion of difference, right, right, he basically, he assumes that Saussure is right about sort of syntax and semantics, and then says, but notice every, every term has its meaning, not just in terms of a structure, but I'm always moving from one term to another, that's the deferring, and then what I'm noting is, the difference between them, the contrast. So you combine deferring and differing to get difference. And what, he's, what he says, I think completely correctly, is that can't be captured in the formal structure. Because every time I try to right. capture it with the formal structure, I'm just replicating the problem. And that's why you can't get any, you can't sort of get outside of this problem uh, in, in an right. important way. Now, for me, I think that's an important point to make. Now, here's what I'm going to say, and I, I think I can even make some textual arguments about this, given his uh, debate with John Stroll and others, but I'll just make it out here in good faith, and hopefully it'll be received in good faith. I think the, that the problem we came to in the computational theory of mind that I just alluded to became the problem of relevance. And people within the computational frame, uh, framework, like Jerry Fodor, right, said you can't account for, and he is a defender of the computational theory. He said, but what the things it can't do is tell you how genuine development, transformational development occurs, because you can't infer a weaker, lo a stronger logic from a weaker logic, and you can't get relevance into your, your computational, logical, mathematical, formal system. And I think that's totally right. That's the whole project, the problem of relevance realization. So I see Derrida and Derrida's difference and uh, my relevance realization. I'm not claiming they're identical, but Man, could they have a very good conversation with each other? They converge on a lot of things. Now, uh, and then if you move up next to the privileging, uh, right, the idea of, you know, that um, nominalism is the case, well, you, you have this weird version of it. You, you have, again, that we, we, there's no transcendent signified, right? You can't, there's nothing really beyond or outside the, the play of symbols, which is nominalism. But but then what they do is right. They 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 make a jet. They 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 do the same thing. They want to privilege the, uh, a certain kind of sign play as somehow getting us to reality. And and this is where many people make critiques. And so what you get is well somehow there's we, the the language of ethics. Or the, and this is from Levinas ultimately through Derrida, uh, but also I don't I don't want to do too much scholarship. But also you get the privileging of moral discourse. Somehow, it's, math isn't the language of reality. Morality is the language of reality. Uh, but that but that doesn't work with the with all of the problems that you can't sort of deduce, right? So, what kind of knowledge is it? Well, it's no kind of knowledge, and you get this weird, you know, you get these weird. Um, things where you, like in Foucault, you're, you're, you're showing the deep inter interconnections between knowledge, sort of the formal system idea, and power, that's what can't be captured in the formal system, and how they're interdependent with each other, but somehow we can critique this, and, right, and we can, and, but, the, but because, what, because of justice or oppression uh, or, you know, the, the abuse right. of power, but where, so somehow these are privileged real patterns, and this is the this is this weird thing. Uh, so it, it it basically how I see it is postmodernism is like modernism committed to nominalism with the escape clause, 
because if you go pure nominalism, you get pure dualism, pure skepticism, pure solipsism. But the escape cause isn't math, it's morality. But not a morality grounded in anything. It's just like math is supposed to be a priori, that we just know that these things are wrong and these things are good. And, and that's really interesting, this, this, this a priori moral system, which, of course, someone like Tom Holland comes in and says, well, it did come from somewhere. It came from Christianity. And, you know, that it, it's interesting. This book I reference often by sociologist Christian Smith, who, in his book Soul Search, he got a, a series of books where he, he basically is is interviewing American teenagers and asking them about their religious and moral. And, and for them, again, it's just self-evident. And that self-evidentialism then, you know, combines with, or, or maybe, maybe it's post-modernity man, manifesting itself through this self-evidentialism. And of course, this ties in with with other American philosophical and religious traditions to to yield kind of what we have here. I, I thought this was, I mean, this first part of the video was just astoundingly good. And he was saying these things like, oh, this, a lot of this stuff makes a lot of sense. Um, right, so a morality the, born purely from critique, seemingly. Yes. Like it can't, yes. it can't get underneath itself, right? It's... <laughs> It, it can't get underneath itself, and it can't ultimately situate its normativity within its own practice. So you practice this on behalf of a justice or a freedom from oppression that can't be properly situated within your deconstruction or your archaeology of knowledge, Derrida and Foucault, right? Um, so notice how they are that so. When you have an assumption between two positions that are opposed, that's a presupposition. And we've got, we're, we're seeing presuppositions here about, uh, about uh, you know, logic, knowledge, reality, meaning. And you also have the, the, presupp the, the shared assumption that I don't have to undergo any deep personal transformation in order to get access to these moral truths, right? I just have a method. I do this sort of deconstructive method, right. and then from the epitome of my guilt or something, I then I then get access to the real patterns of justice and power and oppression. So, what I would want to say, if you agree that those three is that the the idea of deep truths without deep transformation should be questioned because that's a shared presupposition. The presupposition of nominalism with the only one one privileged way of getting through should be abandoned. Should be abandoned. That's what I've tried to do with a, a lot of the trying to bring back Platonism and trying to show the other kinds of knowing is no, no, a deep challenge of that nominalist presupposition. And then finally, a deep challenge of the presupposition that reason is logic. And instead, open up the notion of reason, link it back to transformation. And right in the notion of wisdom. So that, for me, is what I'm trying to do in... Uh, so I take postmodernism very seriously. Now, just for our listeners, this is a question about non-theism. So we're going to get there. But you might have forgotten. But we are going to get there. Because I take modernity seriously, and then I try... Wow, this sounds really hubristic. What I'm trying to do, please remember that verb, is I'm trying to get at their shared presuppositions and challenge the shared presuppositions. So I'll, I'll let you respond, Nick, before I go on to the second part, which is linking it to the theism and non-theism, and then the third part would be to address the supplementary question. Right. I mean, I, th I thought that was a, a wonderful layout of how that development took place. Um, what just I guess the one thing that kept popping up in my mind is how it seems like we end up in these kind of Gerdelian loops um, yes, even within yeah. modernism, are we still yes. stuck in this Gardellian loop? And I think that's important because I think a lot of people have a romanticism about modernism as not being in that loop, as being. Now, a lot of people in the comments were wondering, well, what, what's that? What, what's, what's Nick saying that they're talking this, this 
it sounds like Gordelian, but it's Godel, Godelian loop. So if you look at Godel's, and this came up quite a few times in the comment section, Godel's incompleteness theorem. Again, this from this from Wikipedia. The first incompleteness theorem, any consistent formal system, and again, they were talking about formal systems like a chess, which is sort of in self-contained, it needs nothing beyond itself, that's the idea of it, any consistent formal system F within which a certain amount of elementary um, arithmetic can be carried out is incomplete. In other words, there are statements of the language of F which can neither be proved nor disproved in F. And you go a little bit later, um, and oh, where's the highlighted portion? Come on, come on. The first incompleteness theorem shows that Godel's sentence G of an appropriate uh, formal theory F is unprovable in F because when interpreted as a statement about arithmetic, this unprovability is exactly what the sentence indirectly asserts. Godel's sentence is in fact true. For this reason, the sentence GF is often said to be true but unprovable. However, and a little bit further, um, relationship with the liar paradox. Godel specifically cites Richard's paradox and the liar paradox as semantic analogies of his syntactical incompleteness result from the introductory section of on formal undecidable propositions in Principia Mathem Mathematica and related systems. The liar paradox is the sentence, the sentence is false. An analysis of the liar sentence shows that it cannot be true, for then, as it asserts, it is false. Nor can it be false, for then it is true. If Godel's sentence G for a system F makes a similar assertion to the liar sentence, but with truth replaced with probability, G says G is not provable in the system F. The analysis of the truth and provability of G is a formalized version of the analysis of the truth of the liar sentence. I'm not sure I understand all of this, but this is, I believe, what they're talking about. Wonderful layout of how that development took place. Um, what just, I guess the one thing that kept popping up in my mind is how it seems like we end up in these kind of Gerdelian loops. Um, yes, even within yeah. modernism, are we still yes. stuck in this Godelian loop? And I think that's important because I think a lot of people have a romanticism about modernism as not being in that loop, as being where we broke. And, and that's such an interesting statement by Nix. Uh, romanticism about modernism. Well, what is romanticism? What does he mean by romanticism there? Well, romanticism is sort of this emotion of familiarity, this, this sort of nostalgia. And if we grew up in this thing, we sort of became accustomed to it. And, you know, we see this in our pets. You have the dog who, you know, if you want your dog to be crate trained, get that dog as a puppy and make sure he always sleeps in the crate. I remember, again, get your cards out, Dominican Republic. I remember in the Dominican Republic, once my son, who was just a little fella, he was just a toddler, and he was running around and always rode in his car seat, unlike every other little boy in the Dominican Republic, not every other little boy, the missionaries' kids wore in car seats, but, you know, kids were just in the back of pickup trucks and flying around in cars, just like I was when I was a kid. But I remember once I hadn't buckled my son into his car seat yet, and I put the car in reverse to back out of the driveway, and he just kind of he scrambled into that car seat ASAP to lock himself in. And I thought, of course, the only way, I mean, for him to ride in a car but not be belted, constrained into this car seat is a little bit of terror. And, and so Nick's saying that, yeah, people have now sort of accustomed themselves to the, the spirit of modernity that now there's a romanticism about it. And there's a there's a there's an elevation of it. There's a worship of it. Free -ism as not being in that loop, as being where we broke free from that loop. Um, oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<clears throat> so I think it's important. To, I really love how you tied modernism and postmodernism as basically suffering from the same problem, just switching the area in which it functions. Um, and on the other end, I find it really interesting how you placed postmodernism's um, kind of uh, pattern recognition in the realm of moral, particularly as we watch postmodernism move ever deeper into the culture and its practice and how it has started creating seemingly these types of um, pseudo religions that have, yes. and it's interesting, right? Because it's, you can see the desire for transformation within those yeah. pseudo religions, but it's so bound in, in technique, if you yeah. will, that it can't yeah. actually transform itself. So the right, what's yeah. now, now also right there, his, his, re relationship between technique and transformation so in in this video that i'm working on we'll see if it's ever born about one of the about about what is christianity there's something in terms of the the enlightenment critique of religion which is based in protestantism because deep in the protestant reformers was a critique of certain kinds of ritual and practice and a certain formalism that, you know, when, when Luther critiques the Roman Catholic Church, and this is where I, I, I remember listening, I never made a video about it, but I remember first listening to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and listening to John talk about Luther. And again, I'm no Luther scholar, um, but I certainly have read Luther, and Luther is a very common object of study in terms of uh, if you're a Protestant clergy. And so I'm, I'm not sure, it, certainly nominalism has something to do, has, has a lot to do with the Protestant Reformation, but I'm not sure Luther is quite the baddie with respect to um, nominalism as John asserts. But, you know, a lot of what the, the Protestant Reformation looks at is, in many ways, working from the Hebrew prophets of critiquing the critiquing the religiosity of the people and finding it shallow and this this gets sort of to the heart of this um, the heart of this ongoing critique that that Tom Holland really develops in his work and you watch it you watch him continue to come back to it and again, it begins in the Hebrew prophets, and Jesus reinforces it. And it comes out again in the Protestant Reformation. It, it can look like a cynicism sometimes. It's definitely a critique for when the Hebrew prophets, let's say Jeremiah, for example, the people are saying things like, God will not allow the Babylonians to conquer Jerusalem because we have the temple. And Jeremiah says, you're going to play chicken with God. Um, don't play chicken with God. You're going to lose. And, you know, this, this, this move of critiquing a certain formalism, um, you know, it, it was the sense of, well, I'll, I'll smuggle the wafer. I'll smuggle the wafer out of church. I'll smuggle the Eucharist, the Eucharist out of church and give it to my cow. And, and so on one hand, you've got the Roman Catholics um, elevating and promoting the Eucharist miracles, while this is exactly the point that the Protestants are making all of their making all of their hay. And and that that move is deeply embedded in the Enlightenment critique of religion and and really sets up this this dynamic, this externality that 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 John is laying out here which, which really seeds the the scientific revolution and gets us going it's it's in some ways again the the one-eyed vision of let's take all of this stuff out and see it through one eye and we can gain a power that way and in fact they do and it's a very significant power but but you have to open the other eye to actually live which of course sets up the meaning crisis so the final state of of the of the white male 
is to just endlessly be cycling in his own critique of himself, right? It doesn't actually get, well, and this is perhaps um, interesting when it comes to theism and non-theism in the sense that um, there's a distinct lack of a telos of what that transformation is. Now, now before we get into any telos, I mean, so again, part of part of the critique of theism, especially if we look at Cudworth, a being, and this is exactly where John's going to go. And again, this is exactly where I remember talking to. Maybe I'll still have to work on this. See if I can. Um, Brett Brett Sockled is is a busy man, and and so you know he. Um, he can't always be available for for videos, but I I remember talking to him and thinking, boy, I'd love to see him and Verveke talk about these ideas. And, and I still haven't read um, Nishitani, but but all of these ideas of so okay, so let's say you know in my work here, following even a Jewish scholar like like Kaufman, so. You know, what if, what if my critique of theism is, well, theism is, is and again, its timing is suspicious. Theism is late stage deism, where it's merely God number two and no God number one. And again, I became aware of God number one and God number two when watching Peterson's talk with Brett. Weinstein, with Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris because towards the end of that first one in Vancouver, they have still haven't gotten around to God, but everybody wants to talk about God. Well, what do you mean? Well, then Jordan Peterson reads out his list of how he understands God. And again, I could recognize that God from reading, reading reformational, reading 16th century reformational pastors. Because those descriptions of God were just basically carried over from the medieval period. And then again, connecting that with Brett Sockle's realization that Luther in some ways was, was trying to get back to Aristotle, but didn't recognize that the shifts underneath the philosophy made Aquinas unreachable. And so his consubstantiation is an attempt at, you know, achieving what Aquinas understood as transubstantiation and what Calvin understood as real presence, but then, of course, Zwingli completely undercuts it with um, a symbol. But this symbol is, in that way, simply sort of trapped in a nominalist system. So this, this of course, makes you know, my conversations with Verveke very interesting, you know, given his particular history with Christianity, which he talked about here quite a bit again, too. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on underneath. And, and so again, I, I, I don't I'm suspicious of whether, of whether Luther is the nominalist baddie that he is often portrayed as being, or if, Luther, in some ways, is trying to get at what he saw, what he feared had been lost by the rampant cor corruption in the church that at this point almost nobody denies that there were elements of the Roman church in Luther's time and in Luther's locale because locale is important in this. And then, of course, Luther... You know, after Luther, Luther sort of sets up the rise of Germany, and that will lead to all sorts of philosophy and culture that will come out of Germany. Um, you know, Luther does sort of set up modernity, and Germany in the 20th century, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, before the calamitous two world wars, you know, will become the epitome of a modern state. It's just all so complex to try to boil down into the sentences that we are left to wield. 
And we, we've spoken about this before, but it seems dangerous, right? We don't want to create a telos that is static, um, but it seems like we still need a teleological vision that perhaps describes what a optimal um, state of evolution is or dynamicness, an optimal dynamicness as opposed to a perfect yeah. static. Yeah, I think that's right. Um... I'm torn now, but Nick was so good, wasn't he? <laughs> Been replying to that new point, which is a really juicy one. Sorry, we're still going through. <laughs> and no, 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 no. So I, I'm going to ask you to remember that point um, and remind me about it because I want to first. I mean, because you now we're, we're broaching into the theism, non-theism, and so. Right. By the way, I like that this is flowing dialogically. I appreciate that. So thank you. I really appreciate that. It, it, it helps me a lot. Um, so, I think the the thing about theism and non-theism, uh, sorry, the, or, sorry. Let's do first the theism atheism. So I'm going to try and make a parallel move, right? And the parallel move is a move of well, what, what are the shared presuppositions? Because um, I think it's fair to say, and and you know, many atheists actually explicitly say this, that atheism isn't a substantial position; it is merely the negation of theism. And therefore, it's going to be very much analogous how postmodernism isn't something that has a substantial independent content, but is parasitic on uh, modernism. So you'll hear atheists make this point again and again and again, but it's it's really hard to live with because then suddenly they have to. It, it, the, you can't do it because God is, if you're going to strip God out of the system, he's just in too deep. If postmodernism ever succeeded, it would disappear because its raison d'etre would disappear. Right. Um, and, and this is the point that Peugeot makes in his parasitic storytelling video, that, uh, po that, that so much of the postmodern attempts at art are, are parasitic off the the modernity right same thing with atheism um and, and i suppose many atheists that that's sort of their utopic vision so what what are the what are the assumptions that are shared by both sides with one side affirming and the other side negating and locked together well one um uh, and this i mean this is going to get us into a debate uh, at some point and i welcome it by the way paul and jp and i are going to do this and i welcome this debate but I'm, I'm going to put it aside because I'm going to be responsible to the debate, but maybe I don't have time to do that completely right here, um, which is a debate around what do we actually mean by theism. And, you know, and again, here's another way which Jonathan Pajot. So Jonathan Pajot was way more radical than people realize. I was asked about this and I thought I'd answer it because he's rejecting nominalism at a profound level. He thinks there are real patterns everywhere, as far as I can tell, right? And they have a life of their own. They have an independent existence to which we have to respond. See, again, when he says stuff like that, well, what's triggered in me? Well, I am a Dutch Calvinist. Well, what does that mean? It means I was, if there's anything that the Christian Reformed Church contributed, it is the rigorous worship of the Heidelberg Catechism. And 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 when he says this, I mean, there's, in, in many ways, you know, why I could recognize God in Jordan Peterson's articulation to Sam Harris and what I labeled eventually God number one, or let's call it the arenic God, is at any moment, if, if God were to withdraw his hand, the universe would evaporate. You know, stuff like that in our tradition. And, you know, you might think, well, that's just Vander Klein. No, it's a, Christian Reformed people who were catechized seriously before the dropping of catechesis in the 80s and 90s um, know this. This is, you know, and, and so when I listen to John talk about this and think about Jonathan's patterns and think about what natural theology was for the early deists, they were, they were exploring God when they were measuring gravity. Now think about that. I mean, that language sounds so strange today. They were seeking because God was in the patterns. 
now now you've got God number one and God number two, and and so then when you get to um, Cudworth's, you know, a being, you know, you should stop and say, hey, wait a minute, think about Brett Sockold. God is not something in the system, and. Yes, Luke, panentheism is a little different. That has its own framing in another way. The system is dependent upon God. In him we live and move and have our being. The whole earth is full of his glory, the arenic God. But God in Christianity, in, in many ways, and this again from Kaufman in Judaism, the arena has an agency of its own as it always does. And that was the observation made by Christine Hayes in that lecture from from Yale that I've re referenced many times. That means there are real patterns everywhere, as far as I can tell, right? And they have a life of their own. They have an independent existence to which we have to respond. That makes him much more radical than most of modern Christianity, because modern Christianity, especially Luther, Luther is explicitly and deeply influenced by nominalism. Deeply, deeply, right? And this has been insinuated into Protestantism, I would say. And See, I, I agree with that, that it's insinuated into Protestantism. I agree with that. And, and, and Protestantism is profoundly impacted by nominalism, but I suspect... It's coming in in the 17th century and not so much in the 16th century because I, because I was raised with the Heidelberg Catechism, I could still taste Protestantism before the 17th century. And it's in the 17th century that a lot of this really gets going. And I think it's for that reason that in the 17th century, philosophers are starting to name things in this way. I, I welcome Paul's response on this. And it has become... There it was. <laughs> ...pervasive of Christianity through the Counter-Reformation, etc. Eastern North and, and he's right. In terms of the Counter-Reformation, so Luther... The, and again, I've been reading this book, Reformations. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church has to respond to this. I, I'll just show you the book I picked up. I'm, I'm so excited to get into it. Now, now, I know some of you are going to say, no, Vander Clay, not another book. You don't even have a chance to, to read all the books you talk about. So, Dale Van Clay, not Vander Clay, Van Clay, um, professor of mine at, at Calvin, it was Calvin College then, now it's Calvin University, uh, whose politics many of you would hate. The professor that led me to the rally to protest Ronald Reagan at the Gerald R. Ford Museum. And yeah, I'm going to get in trouble with a lot of you for this. And then I remember, I remember we had this sign, Reagan lies are out in Nicaragua. We were talking about the, that was before, you know, the whole thing, the whole Contra thing blew up because I, I, I traveled to Nicaragua that year and toured the revolution. And, you know, if you ever have questions about that, I'll tell you some of those stories. But from Calvin to the, to the civil um, constitution, 1560 to 1791, you know, when I've been talking about the French Revolution, I, I made the I made the comment that you know Germany and the Netherlands and Hungary and and Switzerland had Protestant Reformation and Protestant churches. The Reformation tried to get going in France, but it was squashed out when the Huguenots were were kicked out. To what degree, because they didn't have Protestant churches, did the French Revolution happened. Now, I recently, Dale was on a listserv that he and I both participate in. And so I finally had a chance to ask him that question because he brought up his book and he was quoting from his book. And he basically said, you know, my, my, my idea was a thesis and he, that's that a thesis that he, he very much addresses and engages in this book. So, you know, John's point here about the Counter-Reformation is I think correct. I mean, these these ideas. Okay, what are these these ideas? These spiritual ideas flowed through the world and had to be addressed one way or another, and they were. And you know, nominalism, nominalism came to the fore and found religious expression in Protestant and Catholic, 
And and so again, John wants to go back to a Platonism, but but I have deep questions as to to what degree nominalism is built into the science that you know he's a scientist and, and so i mean this is this is this is hard stuff and i i just started reading the first few pages of this and i'm terribly excited about it but you know some of you will say no paul my wife used to call me distraction jackson because you know well you're gonna read propaganda you're gonna read you know the religious roots of the french revolution well elul's french right Good enough? Yes? No? Actually, not as it is between Protestantism, I would say, and I, I welcome Paul's response on this, and it has become pervasive of Christianity through the Counter-Reformation, etc. Eastern Orthodoxy, not as much, because it's still tied to Neoplatonism. So that's one way in which Jonathan's more radical. Jonathan's more radical in that he thinks, he said it explicitly publicly, so I, I, this is fair, that you know, there's a real possibility that Christianity is going to die and be resurrected in to a form that we cannot see. That may and and of course Chesterton has basically said the same thing, and I, I think that that is a historical pattern, and and in fact the pattern would be broken if Christianity weren't resurrected. But but each time, I mean, Christianity has this way of. I've, I've, I've talked about this in my sermons. I mean, its relationship with culture is so nuanced and complex that it finds shape in, in lots of different cultures. makes him a radical Christian in the way Kierkegaard was a radical Christian because he sees right. the death, right? And so we may... A very different. Peugeot and Kierkegaard are quite different. <laughs> ...be seeing the death of all of our current understandings of theism. There's a position out there called anatheism, which is what you get after you pass from theism into atheism and then back into something beyond both back. of them. And I see that as a species of non-theism. And so, uh, by the way... That's from uh, Nishitani? Uh, non-theism is not... Uh, and anatheism is... Um, I forget who uh, uh, originally put... There's a book, I think it's the, the anthology's Carrie. I may be missed. I may be misremembered, so I apologize if I've miscited. Okay. There's actually a book called Anatheism, which is a, it's an anthology, okay. uh, I believe. I have it. I haven't had a chance to read it, but um, anyways. so He's got the same disease I've got. <laughs> There's a word for it, too. I forget what it is. Too busy buying books to remember the word about buying books that you haven't read yet. Then publishers send me books. It's like, oh, gosh, what are you doing to me? And, and, and I want to point out that, you know, Paul Tillich, one of the great, great Protestant theologians of the 20th century, you know, in several places, in one place in... And Jonathan Peugeot would say, there are no good Christian theologians in the 20th century. It's certainly not Protestant. Specifically, even titles this way, that he, his ultimate concern, and that was his definition of faith, is for the God beyond the God of theism, because only the God beyond the God of theism will, can rescue us from the meaning crisis, because he was worried about the meaning crisis. And so, right, so I'm not, this is not some strange... So is Peugeot, uh, well, he's talked before about Tillich, and um, uh, this is just getting interesting. It's getting, in it's always been interesting, but it's even getting more interesting. It keeps getting interesting. Thing. This is, right? Okay, so back to it. Now that I've I would argue, this preamble. just oh, to throw a tiny bit in, I would argue that's, attempted to be put very deeply within the Christian tradition in one of the Ten Commandments being do not form an idol unto God, right? Yes, and in many yes, ways, yes. the God of of theism. Thou shalt not make a graven image of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not bow down to it and worship it. Cry the Lord, I'm a jealous God. And, you know, again, I've, you know... <sighs> How on earth have I changed over these last three years? You know, why? So so I think about those commandments and how they, oh, i got to keep my eye on the time here. i got to pick up my daughter. Um, what's behind that commandment? Why did the Jews come up with it? And again, I think 
to many degree in many ways an image once you imagine something and instantiate it in clone now I'll show myself a deeply protestant person here and you know people ask me why don't you go orthodox well quite frankly part of it is if I go into an orthodox church and I see the pictures I get a little nervous like well those are icons they're not images like mm, my heart is an idol maker and you're kind of enticing me because once once you instantiate God, now you say, yeah, but Colossians, Jesus is the icon of the invisible God. Yes, but Jesus is not something I make with my own hands. And Jesus, in terms of his witness, is something that continues to Break the image I have of Jesus in my mind when I read the scriptures openly and honestly, and I continue to do the work in theology. Jesus, it, there's a suchness and a moreness about him that Jesus keeps leading me into. Some is very easy to form an idol of. <laughs> Very, very much so, and, and, and you're exactly right about that. One of the deep abiding concerns of Tillich, because of his resist, resistance to Nazism, he's the first non-Jewish academic mm. to be persecuted by the Nazis, and unlike Heidegger, he resisted the Nazis, and because, precisely because, and I think, uh, uh, like, and, and, and due to, like, his deep critique of idolatry, because right? that's how he properly, I think correctly, understood Nazism. And, and, you know, I remember listening to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and thinking, often when he was talking about Luther, he was talking about Calvin. And if, if I mean, part of what makes the Protestant, I mean, these movements are so broad and there's so many elements to them. I mean, part of what makes the Protestant Reformed, the Protestant Reformed, the Protestant Reformation so powerful is its deep critique of idolatry. Now, I, I would argue that in some of its iconoclasm, it strayed and abused, as iconoclasms will tend to do. But I, I am not ready to fill up the sanctuary of living stones with a lot of statues. I should get in trouble with the Christian Reformed Church if I did, to the degree that there's any that it's possible to get in trouble with the Christian Reformed Church anymore. But. Because this this question about you know and 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 someone might say hey Vanderclay but I see your powerpoints you get you use you use plenty of Renaissance pictures of Jesus and 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 stories and and there are some further to the right of me in the conservative reformed camp that would that would criticize that that use and fair enough I I don't always do it with an easy conscience. My conscience is not so uneasy that I stop. It stops me from doing it, because there, there's a because with with Jesus there's a line you walk where on one hand, on one hand in our in our Christian life we have to continually be reminded that we cannot instantiate God in our images or in our minds or in our in in many aspects, and on the other hand. In order to in order to relate to him, we must in some way, and I think that's exactly where Christ comes in. Okay, so um, and, and again, you get mystics doing the same thing. You get you know Eckhart, for example, making a deep and important distinction between God and the Godhead. Right. So enough, sort of trying to normalize this and show this. This isn't sort of some new strange thing. This is something that has been thought about a lot. Okay, so let's take it off there. Uh, what are the shared presuppositions that were challenging? Um, and one of them is the idea, uh, and this goes to Heidegger, the ontotheological critique, the idea that being, or the ground of being, is a kind of being. So uh, a standard definition, for example, in classical theism, Maybe I'll label that that way because I understand that theism is itself in negotiation right now, given what I just said, is uh, God is the supreme being, the supreme being. So that, and then... Again, that's theism from 
the middle of the 17th century, late 17th century. What you try to do in, in, in theism is you try to amass evidence and argument for the existence of the supreme being. What I often call the super thing in the sky. And then Esther pushed back in one of my comments about, you know, he, he keeps the question. The thing is, God isn't a super thing in the sky. The sky is in God. Well, are you a pantheist? No. Panentheism? I've, I've got real questions about that conceptualization of it. But that's why God isn't a thing in this. Now, God can come to us from the sky. And, and, and this is why I think we ought to be gracious with one another and patient with one another because this is hard, okay? And, and when Jesus, you know, okay, so I've got, on one hand, I've got Verveke, on the other hand, I've got Sam. And Sam, our, our biblical Unitarian in our estuary, and, and Sam, who's read a lot more, a lot more about the Trinity than I did because he grew up in a, in a church who, who couldn't help but always be focused on the Trinity because it's the one fighting point they had with the whole rest of the church. You know, they're like the, they're like the guy who, they're like the, oh gosh, I better watch my illustrations because those are always what get the preacher into trouble. And then, right, in uh, atheism, you try to amass evidence and argument against it. Yes. And what's problematic about that, and it, it's shown in that history I just talked about, is God can't be a being. That, that, that doesn't ultimately make any sense. See, and this is where it gets really difficult, because, and I would, I would switch off of using the being word again, because I think we're, that, that word is getting difficult, because you've got Jordan Peterson using being in sort of a Heideggerian sense, just sort of out there. A being, um, a thing, I, we're, we're, we're wrestling with language here. And, and of course, I had a little bit of a conversation with Nate, and Luke would really have liked the conversation I had with Nate in, in terms of one of the estuary host support group meetings that I participated in, and more is going to be coming out with that with respect to that. But, you know, God is... God is person. Oh, this is hard. Uh, because it's a category mistake. What we want is the ground of being, sort of capital B, that which makes any and all beings possible. If God is a being, then he is just in the set of all beings. Even if he's the biggest being of all, there's God plus all the beings. And this is exactly what Brett Sockold, exactly the conversation I had with Brett Sockold. And, you know, this is this is why transubstantiation, the point that John is just making here right now. And that's 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 and that whole has to be accounted for. So you have to do something very radical to break out of it. And I, I would argue that that's exactly the radicalness that the mystics are constantly calling people to. Right. Um, as they're trying to say. Ultimately, you can't think of God as a being. Now, that's problematic, and let me try to show you why. And I'm not trying to be offensive here. I really do, I hope you believe, I really, I'm very deeply respectful of people who have committed their lives to a, a religious framework. I, I, I hold that in very high regard. But, for example, and notice how tricky this gets. Well, but God is a person. But all the persons I know are beings. Right, uh, right. They're they're limited entities. In fact, that's one of their defining properties. If you sort of dissolve into an ocean, I can't really find you as a person anymore. Right? You have to be a tid thing. You have to be an individual. That's why I can I, I have to treat you specifically and personally. When we mean personally, we mean often we don't just mean. I don't want to be reductive, but part of what we mean is specifically individually. I don't treat you as just humanity. I treat you as Nick. Right? Um, right. So when we think of God as a person, but God can't be a thing, what is it we're thinking? And, we'll, and, we'll, and then we try to say, thing, well, God's more like a person than anything else. 
and you see Thomas Aquinas doing this, but he's even more not like a person than he's like a person because he so transcends it. And for me, but but again, whenever we say a person, we're 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 thinking of Nick or or John or Paul or Jonathan or Jordan or and and, and this is where you know again where I go back to where I go back to the spirit of finesse and uh, I got to keep my eye on the time because my daughter's gonna. Um, uh, this is where we also get into these persons who are uh, like, that I, I, I don't want to insult the angelic doctor but for me that's a bit of a dodge for me it's like well the, what you're basically saying is it's sort of useful but the only justifications are very prim- pragmatic Right, so that's one of the shared. I think I would. Yeah, I I think I would actually push back on this by I think using your own move, which is to say, I I think that so long as we keep that within the realm of the propositional, it absolutely is a dodge. But I think that suspending those definitions, right, almost like this this uh, constant throwing between the hemispheres of the apo- apophatic and, and the, yeah. the, the uh, you know yeah uh, <laughs> apophatic and cataphatic, enables yeah. a particular uh, yeah what's the river or what's the other part of apophatic i'm sorry cataphatic when you're making a f- affirmation Cataph- okay got it got yeah. it yes um it enables transformation if done within a proper i, uh, I agree I agree, and, so- and and you know, sort of, sort of fought to follow. I mean, how does this play out with people, and how has this played out with people forever, and and how then was this seen as religious then in a secular frame when when humanity cried out to the um, to God number one, the 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 agentic God, and. The what it, what is the only way that a response could be heard, but to to personalize it? Th- let's let's think about let's think about Uncle Sam. Um, the 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 United States government is definitely an arenic force in the United States, and there are many agencies within that arena that, and in fact, we call them agencies that 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 express the will of the arena. That is that is Uncle Sam, and the the only way we can relate to it is in fact, as is in fact personally, as as a mode of a mode of relationship, and whereas we can often sort of step back, and that's a that the saber mode as opposed to the conocer mode is a very useful thing. We, we only relate to it from within. And in fact, whenever we relate to something personally, we, we create a mode within the light in order to respond and to engage with it. And, and I think part of the difficulty, so, so then again, the question is, well, well, what is God? What are we talking about when we use that word? And you know, it, it may be a dodge and you know maybe John and I will talk about this Christianity and other religions have almost always said this is this is something that we cannot we cannot finally capture mentally and and our our attempts to capture it are always insufficient and in fact are offensive to it that's that's the whole idea behind idolatry. It's the whole idea behind you shall not make a graven image because you cannot capture me with anything that you do. You can't even capture me with your mind. But then we would say, but in order for me to know you, I need to, I need to have some kind of capture of you. And I think when you have Moses asking to see God's face, that that's that's what Moses is trying to do. Moses is saying, I. If 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 I am going to, if I am going to sacrifice my life to you, not not in terms of one act with a knife, but day by day in terms of obedience, 
I, I have to know how to relate to you. And if I'm going to relate to you, I, I, there has to be a person because that's, that's the only mode we have. I think about C.S. Lewis's till we have faces. And, and the question there is not, can you see the face of God? It's, it's, it's what do we need in order the, the, the problem, the problem with seeing the face of God is not that God has no face. It's that our face is insufficient to see God. So, you know, I love this conversation. And, and John is, again, John is such a good faith conversation partner in this that I, you know, he, he's, It, it, I, I just can't, I just, how, how did I get so fortunate to be able to play in these games right now? It, it's really delightful. And, and, you know, Nick too, what a, what a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful conversation partner Nick is. I, I've got a number of conversations with him early on. We haven't talked for a long time. He's, he's such a, he's such a sweet guy. So I think that the question then becomes, are we trying to make an assertion or are we trying to come into right relationship to like the ground of being, uh, which is akin to sort of what Tillich is talking about. Right. And, and I think the entire, when I think about Christianity and, you know, my own tradition, the entire point of it is to come into right relationship with that which, that whose face we cannot see. And, and again, uh, the difficulty that we have is, I'd love to get rid of the word that, because we are, we are objectifying, you know, in, in a certain way, even using language always puts us on the frontier of idolatry. But the consistent point in at least my theological tradition is God accommodates himself to us because he knows how we are. Can we get ultimate concern for what is ultimate? And what is ultimate is not a thing. But notice what we did. We sort of bashed the, 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 the affirmation and negation against each other, the theism and the atheism, and then we transcended it into something that moves beyond the second presupposition, which is that this, right. that the proper relationship to God is a relationship of belief. Right? And that's shared by both the theist and the atheist. But notice what you... Yeah, and that and that's... You know, and his point here is is very well right, and this has long been an issue, and this is part of what I'm getting into the the what is a Christian video, and that 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 has been consistently worked on from both Protestant and Catholic sources that mere belief is insufficient. In fact, I would go all the way to the book of the book of James, where James says, oh, you believe in God? Good for you. So do the devils. I mean, and so this has been a also another long conversation within Christianity. And notice how that starts to overlap with the shared presuppositions of modernity, because right. this is not, this doesn't require a profound, right, transformation in order transformation, to have this reality yeah. disclosed to you. All you have to do is get the proper set of beliefs and assemble them into a coherent manner for yourself and then affirm them. And then what the, the theist does is affirm them, and the atheist, right, denies them. And then the move you just made is exactly the move that the non-theist wants to do. The non-theist wants to say, no, no, I want to get outside of the... So am I a non-theist? Daughter calling. Of, ...of limiting this to belief as the primary way of doing this. And I want to think... Right. Again, notice how we're now touch it, type, talking the same language as before. I want to say that there are multiple channels and there are multiple real patterns. And in order to get into right relationship with reality, I need those multiple channels and those multiple right, real patterns in order to get the best possible, I don't know, frame, lens by which to try and see what is ultimate, what is ultimately real. And see, See, and, and if you would take that sentence and just substitute God for reality, you sort of have a religious person. And, and John's not anti-religious, of course. And 
you could even say Christ now. And he says, so one of the, some of the edges that John and I keep bumping into with each other will of course be pluralism. And, and this will come up in this, in this conversation. So that's the second presupposition and how it links in. Then what, go ahead. If you wanted to say something, like I don't want to, I don't want to just keep talking. I'm almost uh, curious at that point, if, if, um, figures like some of the early church fathers then would be classified as non-theistic so in their... I, yeah okay, yeah i would i i mean i think i gave you quotes from eckhart that, uh and eckhart right. points back to dionysus uh, dionysus the areopagite and i think dionysus i mean he's clearly neoplatonic in a profound way um, and Neoplatonism and Platonism are properly understood as non-theistic. Um, and Gerson has made a very good argument. Gerson is a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto, and I know all of the important work in the world right now is being done. There's an anachronism at work here, because, I mean, you can read Plato, and Plato will talk about the gods and God, the God, singular. I mean, I looked it up. I mean, I was, you know, when I was going back over Plato's Republic, when I wanted to read some of it in Greek, because I was reading Dallas Willard, and Dallas Willard was connecting Jesus with Plato's Republic, and so uh, I was on jury duty, and it's like, I can bring my tablet, and I can read Plato's Republic in Greek, and then I bump into God, singular, in Plato. It's like, wait a minute. Okay, but when we say, does that make him theist, theism, theist? Well, that theist is a construction of Greek plus English in the latter part of the 17th century. And so what are we talking about here? And you know, Nick just said, well, are some of the church fathers non-theists? Oh. I'm at the University of Toronto. That is, that is in fact correct. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So he has made a very good argument that, you know, Aristotle is actually a Platonist, a deep, a deep Platonist. And so when Aquinas brings in Aristotle, he's bringing in another form of uh, non-theism. Uh, he does amazing things to try and get the... the... The question, of course, is whether we can use this word theism with Aquinas or Aristotle or Plato when the word itself is, to what degree is the word mired in the 17th century? Ah, oh, stuff is so hard. Right, the God of the Bible and the God of Aristotle to belong together. Um, whether or not that still works is a, a, a debatable question. So um, I think you can see, um, I, I, I have to modify it though, because How can I speak about this respectfully? The, the, I mean, the defining feature, of course, of the Christians, even the early church fathers, is the loyalty to Jesus, right? Jesus of Nazareth, and, and to see him as the what would become the second person of the Trinity. And so there's definitely aspects also of theism. What you see, in fact, I think... Again, footnote on the anachronism. In these, in these people, is this real tension between theism and non-theism. Um, and what, what I see is, I see the mystics... Is Jonathan Peugeot turning us all into church fathers? <laughs> theism. I think in these, in these people, is this real tension between theism and non-theism. Um, and what, what I see is, I see the mystics emphasizing the non-theism and the theologians emphasizing the theism. Uh, if, if, if you want me to answer the historical question. So the non-theist also does something else. The non-theist offers a meta-argument. An example is John Hick. He's actually a Christian theologian, but the, he makes a very good argument. The meta-argument is this. Why is the debate between the theist and the atheist irresolvable? It's a good question. Here's his answer. Because the universe is spiritually ambiguous. The universe does not. The universe presents inf enough evidence for both sides that we can't right. ever resolve it. So the problem for me. Well, well 
back to the question of what the theist and the atheist are fighting over is generally speaking, and this is a point that I've made often, and so you've heard me make it, are, is it, are they fighting over the super thing in the sky? And does, in fact, you got the no true Scotsman thing running around behind us, but does, is in fact Christianity a debate about, is there, isn't there a super thing in the sky? Is, is the God of Christianity, and again, ha theos, in the Greek, often with the uh, we we seldom put the definite article in front of God, but yeah, it was okay. But what does that what does that mean then? Well, that means I think that we're 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 bound into a particular problem, which is we're trying to make a, a similarity judgment. We're trying to make a judgment about how similar processes we we see in the cosmos are. To the mind of a human being, we're making a simil a similarity, right because similarities, like you and I, can just dis really disagree about whether two things are similar or not. Because I'll ask you, are an apple and an orange similar? And you may say, yeah, they're both fruits. And I'll say, but one is orange and the other is red, and one has this thick peel and one has a thin peel, right? And and and, and before and, and the point is, this is a deep point. And it's made by Nelson Goodman which is there is no logical way of assigning similarity because any two objects share an indefinitely large number of properties and fail to share them. So there is no, there is no way in which we can... Yet yeah, every argument we do is based on similarities or dissimilarities. That's... Logically resolve this. We can't, we can't say... Look, this is what, and, and and so we don't we don't logically resolve it. We relationally resolve it. I finally, my judgment of the similarity trumps your judgment of the non-similarity. Right, you get lost in a Rorschach test. Yes, yes, and so for me, right, what that means is they're right. They're 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 trying to decide between the theist and the atheist is exactly the wrong thing to do because they're both, here's the, here it is, they're both presupposing that this is an issue that is decidable, that if we just get the right arguments and evidence, it will be decided. And the point that non-theists make is, no, no, it's an undecidable issue. Now, what that means and what I see people doing, and I respect this, by the way, I respect this. I think this is existentially worthy. People will make pragmatic arguments. They'll say, well, for me, if I, you know, if I take the stance towards ultimate reality as personal, I get access to that transformation and a connectedness to reality that I can't get if I think about it impersonally. And, and I think that's part of Paul, Paul's finesse argument, the spirit of finesse, right. that if you, or the argument he asked me to critique. What I ask people to believe <laughs> is I get arguments exactly the other way where people say no no if I think about it personally I, I get disconnected and cut off but if I think of it not impersonally because that's more like the atheist if I think of it transpersonally like the way the mystics do then I get an access that I normally don't get sorry I gotta take this <laughs> hello no worries yeah just please leave it in the lobby or the entrance while he's taking that call, and, and I think I think he's I think he's exactly right. I'm a little, and and I find that with Christian deconstruction all the time. One of the one of the main reasons I see people deconstructing is disappointment with God. Well, what does that mean? They related to God personally, and some bad thing and I don't I don't mean to say that they're because I've spoken with people who've had very bad things happen to them things that were you know very bad things happen this is where obviously the conversation about the problem of evil comes in very bad things happen and so does your it's a pragmatic argument does your personal relating to that which cannot be grasped by our capacities does it work is it when we say is it reasonable does it work does it is and and i think in many ways the christian answer is you got something better and and so transpersonally 
I, I, I think, in fact, the what we're trying to relate to is akin to, you know, Peugeot likes using Santa Claus. I like using Uncle, Uncle Sam. Um, a conversation about principalities and powers. We are, in fact, relating it transpersonally. Now, of course, now it's easy to say the mystics and to sort of lump them together. And surely you can, but now we're sort of back into the, you know, relating, let's say a Christian mystic is an apple and a non-Christian mystic is an orange. Well, what what's the relationship? What's the similarity or dissimilarity to them? Well, they have an experience of oneness. Well, but, but, but then we're sort of trapped in the language game because to what degree are we doing the same? So, and to me, much of this conversation gets into... Okay, all the way back to the Hebrew prophets, the, the deep insight that they had that I think John Walton has shown distinguished them for, from, the, from the priests of many of the surrounding lands was that the... The priests in Egypt, and John Walton has shown this, I've quoted this a number of times, the priests in Egypt, the priests in Babylon, the, the key was to, you know, feed the gods, go through, you know, do service to the gods, bring the sacrifices to the gods, and it was a very transactional relationship. And and the Hebrew, the Hebrew scribes and prophets and, you know, broke that transactionality in a very fundamental way that, interestingly enough, outlived the transactionality of the others. Now, I have to be very careful in there because the transactionality remains, especially in folk layers of Christianity. And I don't think the transactionality is actually ever done away with completely or there's not enough friction in the system to have it work. Boy, I don't know if anything I've just said is intelligible to to you, but and and this is sort of where it comes down. Let's say with with let's so, so what's the difference between John Verveke and I? Are our moral systems incredibly different? No, not much. And and I think that's that's borne witness to when his wife says, "You're the most um, Christian person I know," and she's an atheist and he's a non-theist and. And well, what do you mean by that? Well, she's saying he's he has he's an exceeding he excels at Christian virtues of loving his neighbor as himself. And I see this. I mean, this is this deep respect and and what he does. And of course, I don't I don't live with him. I don't see him up close. He doesn't confess his sins to me. Does he have sins? I'm sure he does. Um, I certainly do. I'm a minister. I'm a Protestant minister. I'm not a Catholic priest, but people do confess their sins to me and. Um, because in Protestantism, it's not that we are against confession. We confess them one to another. It doesn't have to be brought to a priest, the priesthood of all believers, Luther. So so what is the d- difference between myself and John Verveke? Well, some of these beliefs, and fair enough, and I would say that I, I certainly, he and I have a, lot, a great deal of agreement about the critique of that propositional system, and I would argue that that critique is deeply embedded in much of Christianity that he might not be aware of because he's he's just not in the midst of the church with Protestant critiques of easy, easy beliefism, as it would be called, and all these things. So, um, and so definite critique of a lot of this propositionalism that, that, that my confessionalism of my Dutch Calvinism is, is deeply steeped into. But I think often critiqued and deconstructed in pastors and preachers and sermons all the time. And so, you know, would would I say that John Verveke is my um, is my moral inferior? No, and I'd say I wouldn't be surprised at all if he's my moral superior. And and that to me doesn't undo my Christianity. In fact, some of the strangeness of it is that how could he be my moral superior if we're basically within sort of the same moral system, a la Tom Holland. So then where are the differences and what do they mean? And and I think this then gets into a lot of what we call Christian deconstruction, which is Paul goes to church and prays to his God personally and uses his name 
And, you know, even though we don't have an altar and we don't say do what perhaps some more sacramental elements do, we sing praises, we focus attention. I mean, in, in many ways, Protestantism is already highly deconstructed. And, and, and it's an abstraction from some of the physicality of some of the more sacramental traditions, which is, I think, part of the reason why they are, they, they have become so, so many people are interested in them. So, so where do John and I differ? And, well, well, there are definitely places that we bump into and we'll talk about them. And a lot of them will be, again, propositional. And, and propositional for him as they are for me. Is there a God, yes or no? See, I just used a God, the indefinite article. Maybe that's the best article to use with God because of his unknowability. unknowability. And again, that, that, is a, that is a hallmark doctrine in anybody who is trained in, in formal Protestantism. I mean, that's one of the first things that you learn is, is we are too small to capture God in our minds. And, and that is set into us by the commandment, you shall not make a graven image of the Lord your God. So, you know, all of this stuff is very much at play. So there's a package being delivered. Uh, oh, no worries. So do, do you see the point? Uh, and so, uh, you know, Paul's argument is you bring in the spirit of finesse. And for Paul, that's bound up with the, fin the very sophisticated finesse we have to develop towards persons. And that gives us right. access. But what the, what the non-theist will say is, yes. Really good. However, I practice Taoism. I practice Tai Chi. You know what Tai Chi is? It's the philosophy of finesse and flow, and it right, and it sees the ultimate right. impersonally as the Tao. So there's a way of cultivating that finesse that is also possible in an impersonal, or at least transpersonal, perhaps a better word. So what? And what by the moving, please. By moving into pragmatism, you actually, once you make that move, you lose your ability to navigate between the personal and the impersonal as having a kind exactly. of hierarchical yeah. priority. Because you're, 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 you're caught in the weird epistemological metaphysical problem. Because if you move to pragmatism, you're justifying it in terms of how it works for you. That's, the, that's yeah. James's final thing, right? But what you want to claim is, no, no, it has an independent existence, which means it has to exist precisely by how it doesn't just work for you. I mean, that's that's what it is for something to be real. And, so and, and I think that's it's as like it's exactly at that moment that sort of the the Hebrew prophets transcend, say, their Babylonian and Egyptian counterparts. And the the strangeness of the idea that the God of Israel allowed his own temple to be destroyed. And Israel, who should be the people on top of the heap, because their God is the God on top of the heap, um, their God critiques them. And, and so you see all of this set up in many ways, I think, at least in the West, by the story of Israel. Now, in the East... So again, I would just want to name pluralism. I mean, that's one of the issues at, at play here. So, so the pragmatism actually undermines any kind of ontological claim in, in a deep. That's one of the that's one of the deep problems of pragmatism itself. Something I want to talk to right. Jordan Peterson about at some point. Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah. So did, I, did, I <laughs> well, do, did I do enough about all three of the? There was the postmodern modernism, the theism, non-theism. And then the discussion about the apophatic cataphatic. I tried to sort of bring those all in. Did, that was did I, did I... absolutely wonderful. And I could probably talk to you about this all day. But out of respect for the um, the questions I am tasked with reading, uh, I think that was as full an answer as we could hope for. <laughs> right. uh, that was just tremendous. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, because, because it gets into, again, as a, you know, one of the one of the one of the lovely things about John is that he is a practitioner too. He's not just an academic. And again, in the modern academy, you stand outside the light and talk about it. And John plays, and you know, he plays as he talks. And and I too am a practitioner. Um, and so I I find this 
I find this deeply engaging and um, very encouraging. And maybe, maybe John won. Maybe, am I a non-theist? Has he has he pushed me here? But but how would we know? Because I will continue to, well, I'll continue to do what? I'll continue to relate to my God personally, and I will continue to exhort others to do so. And you know this point that he makes. Okay, so you know the crux of the problem of evil is, well, you called on your God and it didn't work. Well, that's sort of the problem of the destruction of the temple, and it's the problem of the crucifixion. I mean, it's the the death of pragmatism happens on the cross. No, oh, this is so much fun. This is so much fun. So I just I'm. I'm deeply appreciative of, you know, earlier I, w- I maybe disrespected my audience too harshly because, you know, I'm deeply appreciative of you all. Thank you for your time and attention. Lion, I'll steal from John Verveke. We're pastors or thieves, I keep telling you. Peterson calls us liars. We're more thieves than liars. We steal all the time. But um, I'm deeply appreciative of John's work and attention that he's given to this little channel. And deeply appreciative of Nick and and what Nick did. Um, I should end this here and take the screenshot. And maybe use it for the um, use it for the. Uh, I should take a screenshot with me in it. So maybe do that now. Oh, I can stop recording. <laughs>